गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू ऑर्थो टीवी ऑनलाइन पोसी वेबिनार्स एंड वी हैंड ओवर द प्रोसीडिंग्स टू द पोसी टीम गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द पोसी वेबिनार uh today we have a very interesting webinar on the mal union of uh, upper extremity fractures uh the coordinator and the moderator for this session is uh, dr ruchuta mehta so i request her to take over the session please ruchuta sure thank you so much uh, dhiran bhai good evening everyone uh we are very very fortunate to have a very astute speaker with us today he is none other than dr joshua abzuk from 2015 to now he is the deputy surgeon in chief and the chief of pediatric orthopedics for the university of maryland children's hospital baltimore he is also the director of the university of maryland brachial plexus clinic in baltimore he had thomas jeff university medical college at the philadelphia hand center and shriners hospital and at st christopher's hospital for children in philadelphia again every uh, medical education of his has been in philadelphia he's also featured amongst the top doctors and amongst the who's who of america many many times he's a fellow and member of the aos posna and traumatology societies amongst many other societies His leadership positions include being in the education chair and the academic chair on several associations, seminars, international symposia, and he has an exhaustive CV of seventy-four pages. I'm sure I'm not going to be able to do justice to all of those things here, but to quickly summarize, he has about one hundred and twenty-four articles in peer-reviewed journals, four books, fifty-four book chapters, two hundred and fifty-one speeches so far. and his interests include fractures uh, of the upper extremity uh, skin lesions neuropathies brachial plexus congenital and problems he's had several publications and book reviews to his name and also is a member of the adrian flat society and microsurgery society he's got a whole lot of interesting work on wrist anatomy besides the interests that i've named so far and he is a good philanthropist he runs a camp for children a free camp for children in egypt and a support group for any child with a limb length difference and he also has a very interesting hobby which we came to know very recently of collecting fire fighting helmets from across the globe ladies and gentlemen i give you dr uh, joshua abzug i welcome him on behalf of posi and request him to start today's talk Well, thank you, Dr. Mehta, and thank you, everyone, uh, for having me today and this evening. I hope everyone is staying healthy uh, during these crazy times that we're experiencing all over the world. My charge tonight is to discuss the malunions of the pediatric upper extremity, and I will focus on various fractures throughout the upper extremity and discuss potential ways to prevent malunion and how to treat them as we go on. Obviously, we will have a quick Q and A session tonight um, after my talk. But please feel free if you have questions uh, to email me, as you see my email listed there. So, I think, in my experience, malunions involving the upper extremity are extremely, actually, fairly common, unfortunately. And sometimes we allow the malunions to occur in an intentional manner because we expect the child to remodel the fracture, and therefore, there's no need. to get an accurate anatomic alignment. The malunions can be defined as a nascent malunion, which is early on and there's callus formation present, but the malunion is not fully established yet, or it can be a definitive malunion where the fracture is completely healed and that would require more formal osteotomy. And these are quite different approaches to dealing with these types of injuries, whether it's a nascent malunion or a definitive malunion. It's always important for us to recognize when we discuss and consider treatment of a malunion whether or not the malunion is functioning functionally limiting or it's cosmetically appealing or both and that will help guide us in our treatment and what our goals of our treatment are. So I think our jobs particularly those of us that take care of children is really to determine whether or not the fracture will remodel or if intervention is even needed. and this really becomes the art of medicine and truly the art of pediatric orthopedics 
and knowing what is acceptable and what is not, ac not acceptable. Because certainly if the fracture will remodel into acceptable alignment and permit adequate function, then we do not need to intervene as the surgeon. So with that background, we're gonna work our way from proximal to distal through various different fractures. I'll begin with proximal humerus fractures. These account for approximately 5% of all childhood fractures. And because 80% of the longitudinal growth of the humerus comes from the proximal physis, these have a tremendous remodeling potential. Furthermore, we have an extremely big arc of motion as you see depicted in these pictures about our shoulder and therefore we can accept some deformity present in that region. Because of this, the vast majorities are treated non-operatively, even if a small malunion will develop. And here are some examples I've pulled out regarding the tremendous remodeling potential, uh, especially due to that 80% of growth that's present. And this you can see from this uh, yellow journal article back in 2015 with an excellent uh, positioning of the uh, proximal humerus in that young child. And here's just another example of tremendous remodeling occurring in these young children. So when should we think about intervening? Well, certainly if an impingement is occurring, if there's substantial decreased range of motion, and in those children that truly have increased physical demand, such as sports participation, where the decreased motion will inhibit their function. And what I've learned is that these fractures that go into varus really can get abutment and impingement of the proximal spike of the distal fragment up against the acromion, and that will limit motion. And these are some criteria that we can see as acceptable for depending on the age of the child. We can see as the child gets older in age, closer to skeletal maturity, we can accept less angulation and less displacement. So if we're going to correct the malunion due to impingement or functional limitation, this is the operating room setup I like. Utilize a beach chair positioning with the fluoroscopy unit coming from the opposite side of the bed, as you see depicted here. I perform a standard deltopectoral approach and I heavily utilize a cob or bone hook to aid in getting the reduction by really pulling on that distal fragment um, inferiorly as it tends to want to ride up due to the pull of the deltoid. In early on nascent malunions, there may be entrapped structures that prevent an easy reduction. And this can include the periosteum, the long head of the biceps tendon or the capsule, all of which need to be removed from the fracture site or malunion site. The fixation in the vast majority of children that still have an open physis in my hands is diamond pins, as you see depicted here. In older children where the physis is already closed or basically closed, I think plate and screw fixation can be utilized. There are certainly other options, but these are my preferences. So here's a case example of a 15 year old right hand dominant wrestler. We can see that this is a nascent malunion with some early callus forming at the level of the fracture site. And if we look at what's happening, you can see that the distal fragment is really getting pulled proximally and laterally, really primarily due to the pull of the deltoid on that fragment. And this is gonna to lead to impingement that'll inhibit this wrestler from performing in his uh, desired sport. So here are his intraoperative fluoro images, and you can see the impingement that will occur right up against the um, head of the uh, humerus and the acromion that will limit the motion present. And we tried, we thought we could break up the callus with some osteoclasis and try to just perform a closed reduction and percutaneous pinning. And I think we would all agree that these radiographs look acceptable in alignment with good positioning of pins. However, you need to be very careful because of the motion present about the proximal humerus that this is not really what's happening. So in my hands, I think live fluoroscopy is necessary to ensure appropriate fixation is present when performing pinnings in a closed manner of proximal humerus fractures, because certainly I think we would all agree this is worse than where we started. Ultimately, this was uh, performed with open reduction of fixation, as you see depicted here, to improve the alignment and prevent the impingement from occurring. And we can ensure that we did not have that malunion that uh, would have occurred with the closed technique. Here you can see, sorry, 
that the impingement is resolved with excellent abduction being able to be performed. Here's another case. You can see again, the early uh, healing with callus formation present, substantial 100% displacement on this scapular Y view and this football player who's 13 years of age. Again, we would expect substantial impingement present between this proximal spike of the distal fragment up against the acromion with attempts at abduction. And here you can see um, the, the malunion further. This was approached in a similar manner as we discussed. And here you could see again, really that impingement that will occur. This was performed with a deltal pectoral approach with an osteotomy present to break up that filling directly into that malunion site and then fixed again with the Steinman pins in acceptable alignment. And here it is three months post-operatively and ultimately the patient was able to return to their sport. So we'll move distally now to the elbow region and discuss supracondylar fractures. Number one malunion that occurs following supracondylar fractures is a cubitus varus deformity. This can occur with casting alone or even following pinning procedures. And really this is primarily due to inadequate fracture reduction. Most commonly, this is just a painless deformity and these children have good elbow motion maintained. However, bad things can happen. One, obviously it's a cosmetic problem. Two, you can have repeat fractures, particularly of the lateral condyle, as was described by Takahara and colleagues. And three, you can have snapping medial triceps uh, tendon that can occur due to the deformity present about the elbow. The most worrisome complication is really tardy posterior lateral elbow instability. And this does not present until two to three decades later where you have instability present at the elbow due to this um, cubic varus deformity that's present. The child will develop elbow pain or young adult and recurrent instability. And this was really noted and popularized by Sean O'Driscoll at a Mayo Clinic about a couple of decades ago. And what's happening is really that the cubitus varus is altering the mechanical alignment of the elbow. So you have medial displacement of the mechanical axis with an altered vector of the triceps pull. And this repetitive external rotation torque that's applied to the ulna will eventually lead to attenuation of the lateral collateral ligament. And ultimately the patient will develop posterior lateral rotatory instability as I showed in that video there. That is certainly a reason for correction um, in an adult and certainly a discussion should be had with patients and their parents um, when cubitus varus deformity is present to see if it's just a, a cosmetic deformity and you should discuss these potential risks that I just discussed. When treating all malunions, I think that simple is better. And in this case for a cubitus varus deformity, a lateral closing wedge osteotomy the simplest procedure to perform. When there's an addition of coronal plane deformity in addition to the sagittal plane deformity, then a biplanar closing wedge osteotomy in my hands is the simplest operation to perform and is my preference. Here's a case example that underwent the biplanar osteotomy to improve both the sagittal plane deformity as well as the coronal plane deformity and reinstitute some flexion into the distal fragments. And here it is in follow-up Certainly a dome osteotomy is an option as well as a step cut osteotomy. However, these treatments are much more involved and much more technically demanding. And these are really reserved for those cases where simpler procedures cannot be performed such as I just showed. When performing the cubitus varus closing wedge osteotomy, I think this technique is technically straightforward. The union is reliable. The lateral prominence that occurs is typically asymptomatic and unrecognized and has a very low complication rate. The procedure is performed utilizing a lateral approach along supracondylar ridge. The brachialis is elevated anteriorly and the triceps elevated posteriorly. Malleable retractors can be placed across the humerus as depicted here. Subsequently, K wires can be utilized, which will determine the extent of the lateral wedge. The first K-wire is placed parallel to the distal humeral joint, just above the olecranon fossa, and the second K-wire is placed perpendicular to the humeral shaft. This, by default, will determine the amount of the wedge that should be removed to correct the deformity. When performing the osteotomy, it's important to leave the medial cortex intact and then remove your bone wedge 
that you created. Two K wires can be placed provisionally, just like pinning a supracondylar fracture from the lateral aspect of the elbow. And then you can crack that medial cortex by applying a valgus moment, and just advancing your two K wires from the capitella region across your osteotomy site. In young children with open physis, those K wires can be left as a definitive fixation. In older children or young adults, one can perform a medial incision to identify and protect and transpose the ulnar nerve and can translate that distal fragment medially to reduce that lateral prominence. This can then be uh, fixed with plate and screw fixation. The following is a video describing a technique that I made with uh, Scott Cozen, one of my mentors, that uh, will walk you through this exact technique. This video will demonstrate humeral osteotomy for cubitus valgus using staples for internal fixation. The child is a 12 year old Guatemalan treated for a right supracondylar fracture by cast immobilization and developed cubitus varus. Note the varus on the right compared to the valgus on the left. X-rays confirm cubitus varus malunion. A lateral incision is performed along the supracondylar ridge. Tourniquet control is used for hemostasis. Deeper dissection is performed to identify the supracondylar ridge that is elevated via subperiosteal dissection. One must clearly expose the distal humerus in preparation for osteotomy. K wires are introduced at the intended wedge to be removed that was planned prior to surgery. The wedge is off axis to decrease the lateral prominence. Here the wedge is designed and an oscillating saw is used to remove the wedge under copious irrigation to limit thermal necrosis. The wedge is removed, leaving the medial cortex intact. Here, the wedge can be seen removed from the wound. Large Kirshner wires, Steinman pins are introduced from the lateral condyle in preparation for provisional fixation. Here, the medial cortex is cracked and the Steinman pins are driven across the osteotomy for provisional fixation. In this instance, staples are used for definitive fixation. The series of steps are used to insert the staples, one lateral and one anterior. Here, the lateral staple is impacted. Next, the anterior staple is placed in a similar fashion with the jig preparing for the tines of the staple and then the staple is inserted. A close-up view shows the osteotomy reduced and adequate staple fixation for rigid internal fixation. Range of motion and clinical examination shows correction of the valgus, full flexion, and full extension. Standard closure is performed followed by cast immobilization for four weeks duration. So, that obviously utilized staples as opposed to the Steinman pins or plate and screw fixation. Obviously there are lots of different ways to stabilize the osteotomy, but the technique itself is all the same. We'll move distally to arm fractures. So I think it's, we all understand that the arm is a paired bone mobile structure with both the radius and ulna really being intertwined due to the interosseous membrane and acting like one. This really performs the stability of the form with the aid of the interosseous membrane and allows for rotation of the form. The vast majority of forearm fractures in children can be treated with closed reduction and casting. In the US, quite often conscious sedation is utilized to obtain an adequate reduction. And again, this goes back to understanding our acceptable limits and what will remodel and what will remodel, what will not remodel. Things that are more difficult and can lead to problems include proximal radius fractures, fractures that lead to decrease in the interosseous space and patients that are skeletally mature or approaching skeletal maturity. Some propose these rule of tens, which mean that a child less than 10 years of old can accept up to about 20 degrees of angulation, but a child greater than 10 years of old age can accept up to about 10 degrees of angulation. Malrotation is not well tolerated. There are people that suggest that only up to 30 degrees of malrotation um, is acceptable in nature. If you have bayonet apposition, 
inspection of both the radius and ulna in acceptable coronal and sagittal plane, then one can consider leaving the fracture in a 100% displaced and shortened manner as long as the child has two years of growth remaining. Malunions of the forearm lead to lots of functional problems, particularly due to loss of rotation. Certainly there can be associated with cosmesis as well. Here's an example where you see this child with the right forearm fracture, again, a proximal radius malunion that led to decreased forearm rotation, particularly with regard to supination, but also with regard to pronation. Malunion correction that occurs less than six, six weeks from the injury can be done in multiple manners. Sometimes it's as simple as just wedging the cast to prevent that nascent malunion from occurring, or even if there's a little bit of callus formation present. Certainly early on, we can re-manipulate the fracture and line it up into acceptable position. And then certainly we have more advanced techniques to uh, correct the deformity and fix it. This can include an osteoclasis, where again, we break up the cross formation uh, percutaneously, utilizing a, typically a Steinman pin or K-wire. And sometimes if there's enough bone healing, open osteotomy is needed. Osteoclasis should be in, definitely in your armentarium as we discuss fractures of the forearm, wrist, and hand. Um, one can consider a mini open reduction of the wrist if the osteoclasis is unsuccessful and placement of the IM nail without need to formally open up both fractures. This case had a mini open reduction with IM nail uh, fixation of the radius, but a closed osteoclasis of the ulna, minimizing the scarring and invasiveness of the procedure. These have been shown to do quite well in children and you can perform a formal osteotomy when necessary, particularly if there is malrotation present. I think it's important that we understand the normal anatomy with the radial tuberosity and radial styloid roughly being about 180 degrees or opposite each other, as you see depicted here, the radial tuberosity on the top and the radial styloid on the bottom. And that should pretty much always be the case. When performing, uh, osteotomies of the form. Again, I think keeping it simpler is easier and closing wedge osteotomies are what is ideally performed. In this case where we want to perform a closing wedge osteotomy of the radius, you would need to do a simultaneous osteotomy of the ulna, not to correct deformity necessarily in the ulna, but certainly to shorten it as performing the closing wedge osteotomy of your radius by default will shorten your form. And if you do not shorten the ulna, you can lead to ulnar impaction syndrome becoming present. It's important to recognize if you perform an opening wedge osteotomy, this can stretch the nerve vascular structures and increase the chance of compartment syndrome and that should be avoided. The approaches are very straightforward. One can perform a standard volar approach to the radius and a direct approach to the ulna. In children, if possible, I think it's better and more optimal by smaller plates as really we can place these children in cast different from our adult colleagues and allow for prolonged periods of immobilization as long as the fractures are in good alignment. We would not necessarily need to have early range of motion and utilize big screw constructs. At times, I will only even utilize uh, four cortices on each side of my osteotomy, particularly in younger children, to minimize the amount of hardware and uh, invasiveness of the procedure. Occasionally, we have substantially malrotated and angulated fracture malunions. And this has been popularized over the last decade um, throughout the world, uh, the utilization of computer assistive corrective osteotomies. Um, here you can send a, a CAT scan of the uh, malunion to a company that can fabricate these jigs. And these jigs can be utilized to make multiple osteotomies to correct the deformity and then uh, placement of your plate and screws directly overlying um, the uh, pins utilized in the uh, jigs which makes this a uh, procedure much less technically demanding than trying to do it by freehand. And here's a case example with the um, pins and then the jigs in place, and then ultimately the correction of this complex deformity uh, as you see depicted here. Here's a, one last case I'll uh, end with on the form is 11 year old uh, female, Erin, who injured herself on a train three months ago she had very limited form rotation. Again, an 11-year-old female is very unlikely to uh, remodel this deformity that's present 
and she has substantially limited form rotation. Um, we do not think she'll remodel as she's a total maturity. And this is less than one year uh, out from the injury, which is ideally the time to interact and going to um, intervene to correct the deformity. So again, a VOR approach utilizing uh, to the radius and the direct approach to the ulna. And again, keeping it simple, we perform closing wedge osteotomies of both uh, malunions. And here's the uh, final uh, product as you see depicted here. And here's her forearm rotation. Not perfect with regard to supination, but uh, pronation in my opinion is much more important in this day and age technology. And certainly she has functional motion at this time, much better than a 10 degree or 20 degree arc of motion. So in summary, with regard to forearm malunions, remodeling certainly has much greater limits than the fractures closer to physes, particularly rapidly growing physes, such as the distal radius or proximal humerus. Um, the malunions can lead to poor outcome, particularly loss of forearm rotation. The osteotomy will yield the best result, particularly when performed early, uh, less than one year out from injury, and when there's greater than 20 degrees of angulation, and particularly in um, substantially deformed malunions, preparative planning, and the surgery must be executed a little well to obtain optimal results. So we'll continue moving uh, distally to the uh, distal radius. Uh, these fractures, uh, as we all know, are extremely common, accounting for 30 to 50 percent of all pediatric fractures. The vast majority of these are easy to tr treat. They're predictable and have excellent outcomes. However, they can be difficult if they don't follow the rules. It's important to remember that one third of these fractures that need to be reduced will ultimately be displaced, and therefore, close observation with frequent repeat radiographs is necessary to ensure that the fracture does not go on to malunion. Here's a case of a nine-year-old who fell off a swing. And you can see the initial uh, fractures here. And one week later, you can see that the fracture has gone off to begin to lose the reduction. However, that would likely be acceptable in that nine-year-old child. Here are the parameters you uh, would find to be acceptable off of various texts. You can see them listed. Again, as you get older and approach maturity, we accept less deformity. These are the predictors of loss of reduction, including severe initial displacement, an isolated distal radius fracture, associated ulnar fracture at the same level. But the key one that we can control really deals with the initial reduction as well as the casting technique. It's very important that we have a cast index of greater than 0.7. And this is extremely important to prevent the loss of reduction. Weekly radiographs should be obtained at least uh, every week for the first two weeks to ensure that the fracture is not losing alignment. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, the key is recognizing what will remodel and what will not. And the remodeling is really dependent on the number of years of growth remaining, the proximity of the rapidly growing physis, such as a distal radius, where there's 80% of the longitudinal growth of the radius occurring, how much angular deformity is present, and then also the plane of angulation relative to the nearby joints. I think we all recognize that fractures closer to the physis and angulating a plane of motion of the joint will have the greatest remodeling potential. And here's just a case example from a Yellow Journal article um, of a young child who was able to substantially remodel um, that massive deformity that was present by 18 months following the injury. So let's go back to our nine-year-old male who fell off a bunk bed. We have this 100% displaced fracture of the distal radius undergoes a closed reduction. I think we would all agree this is certainly acceptable in nature, but over time we can see that the fracture is leading into a radial deviation, but this is occurring because this cast is not well applied and not in a good position because of that increased space that's present. And that's really why that fracture fell off because of poor cast plus placement. What should we do? We should do nothing. We know that this nine-year-old will remodel this deformity and we can uh, again allow for an intentional malunion to occur because ultimately remodeling will correct the malunion without the need for surgical intervention. So can we predict how much remodeling will occur? Well, this article tried to do that. They looked at 63 children retrospectively and they came up with a very complex formula to try and predict this. Unfortunately, this is not practical and I have not been able to adopt this into my practice. And therefore, it really comes down to my experience and understanding of the literature 
to be able to predict who is going to remodel and who will not. I've developed this algorithm for distal radius fractures to treat fractures that I do not think will remodel that have had a lot of reduction and developed either a nascent malunion or impending malunion. When I return to the operating room, the first thing I should always do is attempt my close reduction again. If I'm able to re-reduce it, then I may be able to just place a pin to stabilize the fracture without anything needed that's more invasive. If my attempt at closed reduction is unsuccessful, then I can proceed to an osteoclasis. Again, the osteoclasis is taking the pin and place, placing it directly into the fracture site to break up some of that early callus formation that's present. If I'm successful at that point, I can proceed again to my place my pin to stabilize the fracture. If I'm unsuccessful with the osteoclasis and it's a physeal fracture, I can perform a very mini approach if this child is not approaching skeletal, or if this child is nearing skeletal maturity and break up the impending union at that point in time, understanding that there likely will be a physeal arrest and I should perform an associated distal ulnar epiphysis. For metaphyseal fractures that are unsuccessful um, with regard to osteoclasis, these will require more open reduction for internal fixation. And I'm gonna walk through this algorithm with various case examples. So here's a four-year-old who fell off a swing, was placed in a long arm cast, had that initial fracture of the distal radius, and over time, 11 days post-injury had gone on to substantial dorsal angulation that we felt was likely going to worsen over time um, and potentially not remodel, particularly because the ulna um, was not deformed with it. They went to the operating room and attempted a closed reduction unsuccessfully as this already had early healing. And we performed a gentle osteoclasis by placement of the pin into the fracture site. And we're able to correct the deformity into acceptable alignment, not perfect, but certainly acceptable for this young child, stabilized it from worsening again. And that went on to heal without any issues whatsoever. When I perform these procedures in the operating room, I invert the fluoroscopy unit and utilize that as the operating room table, as you see depicted here. For my percutaneous pinning procedures, I do not feel as though a fall prep and drape is necessary, as this just leads to increased medical waste and dollars and increases the time in the operating room. I utilize this semi-sterile technique, as you see depicted here, of just a towel on the fluoroscopy unit. We'll put gloves on only, no gowns, and we'll utilize this prep stick. Uh -huh. I'll take a right glove. So you can see that our scrub person is scrubbed, but us as the surgeons will maintain the sterile field without the need for formal downing up, just the gloves. Under sterile technique, with just our gloves and the towel, we can percutaneously place our pin and then, sorry and then drive it across the fracture site. Once the pin is in an adequate position as confirmed fluoroscopy, we can bend the pin as we would in any other manner. And here is our final product from an osteoclasis and percutaneous pinning. Again, casting is extremely important when um, treating these fractures, particularly the nascent malunions, as they still have potential to displace over time. And therefore, excellent casting technique is imperative. Hardware is removed at four weeks in the office setting, just as you would in an acute situation. Here's what the literature says about early treatment or callocasis, clasis. Um, of treating a nascent malunion. This was performed two to six weeks post-injury in this series of 21 patients. All of the patients had excellent results with less than two degrees of residual um, angulation at final follow-up. And this series did not report any complications.
So let's run down the algorithm. Here's a 15 year old male who hurt his wrist four weeks ago, and then it was re-injured when he was arrested by the police. And the emergency department, the residents attempted to reduce the fracture, but there was no motion present. Again, I will tell you this child is 15 years of age, and you can see from his feces that he's almost skeletal mature. As we follow the algorithm, we go to the operating room and attempt to close reduction, which was unsuccessful. We can attempt our osteoclasis, but this is pretty well healed as you can see. And therefore, because this child will not um, grow and be able to remodel this, and we are going to accept the fact that we're down to physis, we can perform a mini approach to correct this deformity that would be unacceptable in an adult population. And here we are intraoperatively. You can see uh, this is pretty well healed at this point. We try to do the osteoclasis, understanding that we would likely damage the physis, but there's no movement present at the fracture site. What we'll do is a mini approach and place a small osteotome, quarter inch through a dorsal approach directly into the fracture site, perform our osteotomy, then we can reduce the fracture and stabilize it with diamond pins, as you see depicted here. We would normally, if the distal ulnar physis was open, perform a concomitant distal ulnar epiphysiodesis to prevent ulnar abutment syndrome, uh, but that was not necessary. Uh, sorry, we did do it in this case. It must have been open, sorry. Um, here, as you see, depicted. Okay, so let's move away from physial fractures and move to a metaphyseal fracture. Here we see a 13-year-old female who fell off a horse, had this initial uh, distal radius and associated ulnar fractures, underwent a close reduction. I would think we would all agree, actually the alignment is excellent, including the cast positioning. However, two weeks later, um, the child has gone on to a nascent malunion. We can see the callus formation present and a substantial deformity particularly present in the distal radius. And again, loss of that interosseous uh, space present distally. So if we go back to the algorithm, we'll attempt a closed reduction, which will not be successful. We'll attempt osteoclasis, which was unsuccessful. And then we would proceed to a formal open reduction to fixation due to this being a metaphyseal fracture. And that's what was here, as you see, to correct the deformity. And here she is six weeks post-operatively doing well. One last one, a 14-year-old uh, child who was involved in ATV accident. And here we see the child three weeks post-injury ready abundant calcification present, likely will not remodel this completely, particularly uh, enough to allow for good remodeling at the DRUJ, which we can see is malaligned in this radiograph. And this would undergo a formal small opening wedge osteotomy utilizing that volar approach, as you see depicted here. So uh, I just mentioned that last case, uh, problems with the DRUJ. There's a condition called supination dissociation, where you have malalignment of the DRUJ, which leads to a loss of supination in, in the child. And here you can see that deformity present curving with the dorsal angulation present that threw off the DRUJ mechanics, leading to this loss of supination. So here's a case example, a 15 year old right hand dominant male that was wrestling with a friend, sustained this fracture, I think we would all agree that this is very minimally displaced, not much of a big deal, but it is in 20 degrees of dorsal angulation if you measure it out. They apparently at the outside facility tried to reduce this, um, but in my opinion, it really didn't move and it stayed at 20 degrees of dorsal angulation. And here it is uh, one week later, no change, persistent dorsal angulation. And here it is a month. And here it is three months allowed to unite in that dorsal angulated posture. A little bit of remodeling has certainly occurred as we all see here. What happened though, is as this child grew, this deformity migrates proximally. And that's really what throws off the form biomechanics. And ultimately the child presented to me one year post injury with complaints of limited form rotation of only 30 degrees of supination compared to 80 degrees on the right side. And these were the current radiographs and again, this is not as dramatic as the first picture I showed you, but you can start to see that the formula that's present and migrated proximally into the form that's led to decrease of form rotation. And here it only measured out to about 10 degrees. So the child was, was able to remodel 10 degrees of the initial deformity, but the slight dorsal curvature in the distal third of the form has led to that decreased supination. And this is treated with a radial osteotomy to correct that dorsal tilt. 
and immediately postoperatively, we're able to achieve at least 50 degrees of supination into functional motion for the child. I'll end uh, distal radius with a, a crazy case. This is a malunion and physeal arrest of the child that presented seven years after the original injury with complaints of deformity and pain due to ulnar abutment syndrome, as you see here. Here are the child's initial radiographs from the injury. Here's the post-reduction and casting. It's not perfect, but likely acceptable at the time given a child's age. But seven years later, the patient came to my office with this uh, gross deformity and a substantial um, ulnar positivity. And this is the uh, radiographs. Here you see obvious uh, ulnar positivity, but really a uh, reversal of the radial inclination. And this occurred due to a physeal arrest that was a partial in nature with continued growth of the ulna. And here the child is gonna be brought to the operating room for an osteotomy to uh, try and improve um, the positioning. And this was uh, treated with an uh, iliac crest bone graft, as you see obtained here, a laminar spreader placed in the osteotomy site. And certainly we did not get a perfect result, um, but something much better to prevent his uh, deformity. Uh, we accepted the fact that the plate was a little bit off the bone and a uh, planned removal and the child needed a concomitant ulnar shortening osteotomy and uh, distal ulnar epiphysiodesis. So in conclusion for dysphagias fractures, um, one should not accept the unacceptable reduction. You wanna treat this early with a ideally uh, anatomic reduction or certainly acceptable alignment. Uh, you wanna avoid multiple or late reduction attempts as this can lead to physeal arrest. You wanna make sure you have excellent casting technique to limit the chance of loss of alignment. And you wanna make sure that you follow these weekly for at least two, if not three weeks to ensure maintenance of susceptible alignment. Remember that a fracture in a preteen can become a form deformity as the child uh, grows and the fracture deformity migrates proximally. You must inform parents about potential for loss of reduction and physeal arrest. And it's always important to bring these patients back for repeat radiographs to assess for physeal arrest. Um, following these injuries. So I'll end on uh, hand fractures and then uh, we can go to um, Q&A. So the first topic I wanted to bring up was a uh, first metacarpal base fractures. These can be quite tricky uh, fractures to a uh, diagnose uh, certainly um, to treat at times due to ligamentous pull at the base of the first metacarpal. Here's a case example of a 17 year old football player that hurt his thumb and had pain in the CMC region. And these radiographs uh, do not demonstrate anything substantial. And I would argue that these are not adequate radiographs because there's no true lateral nor a true PA view um, for us to have orthogonal views to uh, look at that CMC joint region. Um, this tuberosity initially was thought by someone to be a fracture. The child was casted for three to four weeks. The cast was removed and the child was doing okay and I returned to, to that patient four weeks later now eight weeks out with their, from their injury, um, still with pain. And now we can see that small fracture fragment that uh, was present all along that was not treated right at the base of the first metacarpal. So uh, the initial provider had recommended therapy um, despite this uh, malunion. And you can see that this is actually the fracture fragment as we all know from our adult hand surgeon colleagues, that this is a fracture fragment, stays in the anatomic position, actually the metacarpal, the shaft that migrates um, out of position. And here we can see abutment. Um, and it's no surprise that despite therapy, um, the child still had pain and uh, was ultimately referred to me. And here are his intraoperative fluoroscopy in images. I think you all know that this was uh, treated with an osteotomy to correct that malunion and restore um, anatomic alignment of the CMC joint of the first ray. Here's another example, a 13 year old uh, male who hurt his thumb playing baseball four weeks ago. Someone had run into him. Um, initially, I'm not sure, I don't recall the specifics um, if this fracture was missed because of the overriding nature um, from that institution or a child initially did not present um, to someone, but I'm pretty sure he did present and this was missed and not recognized as a fracture early on. And uh, my questions would be what diagnosis, uh, I just gave you that obviously, but um, need any additional imaging, what would your treatment plan be? And here it is 
uh, zoomed in with adequate radiographs, really at a PA view of that first ray. And it's pretty clear that this child had a first metacarpal fracture that's 100% displaced and overriding. And this was taken to the operating room uh, to correct the malunion and get the first ray out to length and then fixed with the uh, K wires as you hear. Uh, finger fractures, um, condor fractures, I think we all recognize that we would need uh, to get our condyles out to length and um, restore the articular surfaces as much as possible. This is a 13-year-old female who injured her small finger six weeks ago. Uh, she had some pain, but really didn't present until her deformity occurred. And here you can already see a nascent malunion occurring with some early calcification present on the uh, finger. And this was treated in the operating room with a small osteotomy of that region. Um, it's important that you avoid damaging the collateral ligament as this is where the uh, blood supply comes to the uh, condyles. So a minimally invasive approach is ideal. And you can fix these in various ways, plate and screw fixation, or here you see a little combination of a screw and a K-wire, um, but lots of uh, options to uh, stabilize this once you get it back out to length. And then phalangeal neck fractures. Hopefully everyone's familiar with these injuries. There are lots of different names for the same fracture. Um, these are transverse fractures in a neck of the phalanx, usually the proximal or middle these are seen primarily in children and most commonly are occurred due to crush mechanisms, uh, particularly in young children when their finger is caught in a door, a child tries to pull their finger out and they get a fracture to subchondral region. These are uh, important to recognize as they often can get missed. Um, you get volar angulation at the fracture site with dorsal displacement of the condyles um, and extension of the condor fracture fragment. And these get missed because on the PA view, can look um, minimally displaced or just uh, non-displaced really. And it's not until you have the true lateral view that you can see the displacement present. And these fracture fragments can be quite small due to the cartilaginous nature of the articular surface. You need near anatomic uh, reduction to restore the subcondylar recess to allow for that hyperflexion, particularly of your P joint, which goes beyond 90 degrees when flexing. I think this is analogous to a supracondylar first fracture uh, with the anterior humeral line. And we published an article discussing a volar phalangeal line. Uh, basically, it's the same concept. You want to draw a line and make sure that your condyles are sitting volar to this line to ensure that you can obtain that adequate flexion into the subcondylar recess, as you see depicted here. If you don't, uh, certainly the child can lose the flexion. Uh, they may also have malrotation present and lead to deformity and scissoring of the fingers um, and all of this you want to avoid. So again, if it's a nascent malunion, this common theme that you've heard throughout this talk, an osteoclasis is an excellent technique. You can perform this and then do a dorsal block pinning and uh, place your pins to uh, treat the fracture. If you're going to perform an open reduction, again, you need to protect the blood supply, which is entering through your collateral ligaments. Here's a schematic of Osteoclasis technique. Uh, you can see the fracture with the healing callus, the K wire introduced into the fracture site, breaking up that callus. And then you can utilize the K wire, similar to a Kapanji type technique in the adult distal radius population, to lever the distal fracture fragment into place and then stabilize it with an additional wire or two. Here's a case example of a 10 year old female. You can see the fracture fragment sitting dorsally, the osteoclasis performed and levering the distal fragment into a position and stabilizing it with an additional K-wire. Once an establishment union has occurred, you can see if you think the fracture will remodel. This is slow as the fracture is far away from the physis, um, since the physis is proximal in the phalanges and these fractures are distal in nature. There was a small series out of our friends in Atlanta that followed eight patients for at least a year and what they found was there was a fair amount of sagittal plane remodeling from 31 degrees to zero, but the coronal plane did not remodel very well um, with the patient still having residual deformity present in the coronal plane, leading to 25% uh, of two other eight patients still having complaints of cosmetic coronal plane deformity present. An alternative option besides an osteotomy is a subchondral fossa reconstruction. This can be performed with a volar approach where you basically carve out that subchondral recess with a small burr. This can improve motion, but certainly does not normalize it. And then when necessary, you can perform an os formal osteotomy 
as you see depicted here for this fracture fragment um, to correct both the coronal plane deformity as well as improve vaginal plane deformity. So in conclusion, malunions of the pediatric upper extremity are extremely common. It's important that we as pediatric orthopedic surgeons understand what will remodel and what won't. And if the fracture is not going to remodel, we wanna try and act early with less invasive techniques such as an osteoclasis. And if a formal osteotomy is needed, my preference in the vast majority of situations is to perform a closing wedge osteotomy whenever possible. Thank you for your attention. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Abzug, for a very, very practical and a really exhaustive overview of uh, uh, the entire gamut of uh, malunions, I think, right from the humerus, uh, proximal humerus, right to the tip of the fingers. And uh, I must congratulate you. It was very well covered and very case-based, so I'm sure our audience has enjoyed it. So uh, we have uh, some questions pouring in for you. The first of them is from Rajiv himself. And he says uh, he wants, would like to know your opinion on uh, treatment of plastic deformation. Yes. So again, I think plastic deformation depends on um, one, the age of the child, uh, but really more importantly, what's happening with it. So if it's plastic deformation of the radius and ulna, then that might be okay, particularly in a young child without any necessary intervention. However, we need to be very careful, particularly with plastic deformation in the form, if there's plastic deformation of the ulna that can lead to a montasia fracture dislocation. So a small amount of plastic deformation in the ulna only can lead to ultimately the radial head dislocating from a montasia fracture dislocation deformity, and that will require treatment with an anatomy down the road of the ulna. So I think, again, you need to recognize what will remodel and what won't remodel, and understand if the deformation is in both bones of the form or just the one bone. So uh, the other question, again, uh, in, is followed uh, by Rajiv uh, with regards to the montasia that if you could uh, spell out the when to uh, intervene and when not to intervene, what would you be a criteria in the Montagia uh, conservative versus operative? So, so that I you don't end up with a late, late radial head dislocation. Yes. Um, so I thought about putting that into this talk, but that, as you everyone knows, can be a full 45 minutes in itself. Um, so I purposely stayed away from it. Um, but I think the key with montages is to be aggressive early to prevent the late radial head dislocations. So when in doubt, um, I will treat the ulnar fracture or an acute montasia fracture with fixation early on to ensure and prevent late um, dislocation of the radial head. So for example, in a, a transverse fracture of the ulna, if I have any question whatsoever, I will put a flexible nail or a big Simon pin down the canal of the ulna, treat it um, in any length stable fracture early on. Um, if I feel as though there's any change in alignment following the initial closed reduction. If it's an unstable fracture, then I will certainly go early on to plate and screw fixation. And there was a study by CHOP that showed this algorithm for uh, intramedullary fixation for length stable fractures, O-brain reduction uh, and plate and screw fixation for length unstable fractures led to excellent outcomes. Because as all of us know that treat um, late presenting Montasia fracture locations, they can be very challenging and us being a little bit more aggressive early on can lead to preventing those problems later on. In the very young child, the last comment I'll make is when in doubt, I will perform an arthrogram in the operating room to assess the radial head, because I think we sometimes get fooled, particularly in a young child, I'll say under four or five years of age, thinking that the radial head is lined up pointing okay. But if we do that arthrogram, we can see that there's really subluxation of that radial head and we need to correct and intervene the ulnar deformity to align that radial capitellar joint into anatomic position. So hopefully that's a short answer that covers Rajiv's question um, without getting into too much time on that topic. Yeah, that's, that's quite nice. Uh, there's one more question from Dr. Jaswinder in Patna. 
uh, what would be an indication to use bone graft after osteotomy for malunion correction? Yes. So in my hands, as I hope you glean from the talk, I think the key, one of the keys to malunion correction is trying to keep it simple. I think we as surgeons want to do more complex surgery because we find it fun, but I think we all recognize that leads to more complications and less optimal outcomes. I think that's very true as we talk about malunion correction, where I understand on paper how to perform a dome osteotomy um, in a supracondor region, and I've done it, but it's much more technically demanding, and I think the outcomes are not as good as performing simple closing wedge osteotomies, either uniplanar or biplanar, if we can correct enough deformity. So utilizing a closing wedge osteotomy obviates the need for the bone graft because we get good bone to bone contact and these typically young, healthy children without the need to place a bone graft. It's when you get into the opening wedge osteotomies that you need to place the bone graft. And that's where, again, I think in my hands and most people's hands in the literature that more complications occur. So I think the key is really to try and keep it as simple as possible to correct the osteotomy, I mean, to correct the malunion. And that's typically performed with a closing wedge osteotomy. Yes. And uh, two questions from Sandeep. Is it mandatory to correct all components of a cubitis virus? And what is the optimal age when you would recommend a correction? So we could take it one at a time if you wish. Is it mandatory to correct all components of cubitis virus? All right, so I think, and I didn't get into this a lot in my talk, um, but when I talk mainly on malunions just on the elbow, um, or really any malunion, I think it's again important for us to take a step back and remember that our job as a surgeon is not always to just correct something because we see something that's deformed. And this really comes from my training with regard to congenital hand, um, deformities where we may, or a toe syndactyly is a great example. Just because a toe syndactyly exists doesn't mean we need to separate those toes because there's no functional limitation present. So I think as we talk about cubitus varus in particular, for me, every time I discuss cubitus varus, I have a very long conversation with the parent because I need to understand what the goal of the surgery is and why we're doing it. And is it just a cosmetic surgery or are we doing it to prevent the potential for the posterior lateral rotatory instability that we discussed earlier or the repeat fractures, or does this patient already have a snapping triceps tendon and that's why they're here and the cubitus varus is the underlying reason for the snapping triceps tendon. So I think that, and the same is true as we were to go to the forearm and discuss, you know, a forearm osteotomy, what our goal of that operation is. So I think cubitus varus is harder because we recognize that even though I listed all of those potentials, the repeat fracture, the, the snapping tendon, the uh, instability, um, those are pretty rare. And there are a lot of people walking around with cubitus varus that have no functional limitations whatsoever. And it's purely a cosmetic deformity. And if it's purely a cosmetic deformity, the parents need to recognize that there could be a pretty big scar, as you saw in my video and my pictures, present to perform the osteotomy. And they're going to be taking something that doesn't have a big scar on the form, on the arm, and have an operation that, that corrects this deformity, um, which may be less obvious than the scar itself. So I think that becomes a very deep conversation with the parents. But if you are going to correct the deformity, I think you want to correct it to match the other side, to, is, is the short answer to the question, um, as much as possible in both planes, right? So if it is extended, I will build in some flexion into my osteotomy. Um, and if it's pure, true, just sad plane deform or coronal plane deformity with the cubitus varus, then I'll try and match the amount of valgus on the contralateral limb to correct it as much as possible. And typically by placing those two K wires, one parallel to the joint and one perpendicular to the shaft, that basically will do it for you because that's where the child was meant to be. And his second question was, what is his optimal, uh, what's your optimal age at which you would recommend the correction? Yeah, so this goes uh, back into part A of my answer to the last one, into the conversation. Particularly in young children, um, parents aren't sure that it's really bringing a child and are happy to watch it typically remodel. Um, I would say, ideally, from my hands, a couple of things. One, if I'm going to correct it, I think earlier is better because, particularly in a growing child, that cora, right, center uh, angle is going to migrate. And you want to try and keep it as 
distal as possible into the metaphysis to better healing. So that's number one. So I'll give you a number of within two to three years um, following the injury if you're watching it for a period of time. But the second comment I'll make is I think earlier is better with regard to age. Um, so ideally utilizing fixation, that's K-wires, instead of having to go to a plate and screw fixation as a child is older, I think parents are happier to have the wires removed and not necessarily leave a plate and screws inside the child. And sometimes if you go into plate and screw fixation or as a child is older or a young adult, um, as you saw in the video or my pictures, um, we'll go medially um, to release the ulnar nerve and transpose it. So now you have two incisions and a much more involved operation. So I think the bottom line is sooner rather than later and younger rather than older. Okay, we have another question coming in from Anir Ban. Um, in distal radius physial fractures, one of the dictums was not to be aggressive in correction after the initial seven to 10 days, since the risk of iatrogenic physial injury is high. Does the MIS algorithm give less physial arrest in the long run? Does the which algorithm, my algorithm? Yes, the MIS, yeah. the minimally invasive Algorithm. algorithm. Yeah, so my algorithm really deals with non-union or malunions that we know are going to occur that will not remodel. Um, as you saw with my mini osteotomy as I followed that algorithm down, the only reason I performed that mini osteotomy was because it was a male that was 15 years of age and had minimal growth remaining. If that was a eight-year-old, for example, uh, we would never perform an osteotomy or do any uh, attempt at um, osteoclasis near the physis beyond about 10 to 14 days from the injury due to increasing the chance of physial arrest. We would allow that to remodel. And if it didn't remodel down the road, then we would perform a formal osteotomy uh, later on once the child was done growing. But typically, as long as there's two years of growth remaining, um, most of them will remodel if they're physial fractures. So, and yet I think cubitis virus seems to be a really popular topic. So we have another question coming in saying, have you experienced any recurrence during, uh, during the cubitis virus corrections due to avian of trochlea? And if so, how do you deal with it? Yeah, so uh, yes, I've seen recurrence occur. Um, so I think we need to break it into two parts. So recurrence has occurred uh, due to incomplete correction. So it wasn't necessarily true recurrence, but someone who performed the osteotomy initially and didn't get um, adequate correction of the virus. And then as the child grows, it becomes more obvious again later on, uh, particularly as that deformity migrates proximally. And then number two, um, we've seen recurrence due to physial arrest um, of the distal humerus. And that can certainly lead to recurrence of a cubitus virus deformity after correction. So again, you gotta be very careful with your technique. Uh, make sure that you don't avoid, that you do avoid uh, posterior dissection um, as you're in that metaphysis because you don't want to damage any of the blood supply to the distal humerus. Okay, thank you. And a question from me now, um, any particular reason for doing the uh, humerus, proximal humerus unions in the chair position versus supine? Does that uh, kind of help you do a, uh, the maneuver of reduction? And if so, any tips about the same? Sorry, you broke up a little bit. I'm not sure if someone else heard that repeat or if you want to try again. So when you do it, the proximal humerus in the B position, why do you prefer it versus doing it in supine? Uh, and any tips for uh, the maneuver of reduction? Yes, got it. Okay, so I prefer a B position because typically the proximal sorry, the proximal spike of the distal fragment has migrated proximally, right? And we need to get it down underneath the head and neck region. So I think by putting them into beach chair, gravity is going to help me pull that distal fragment, the shaft of the humerus, underneath the head and neck. And then my trick is a cob or a bone hook right into the medullary canal of that distal fragment. So I'll put the bone hook in and pull the shaft down underneath the head and neck. Um, or I'll put the cob in and try and use the cob to then slide the shaft um, under the cob to get it under the head and neck. Um, and I think that by the beach chair, 
I'm having gravity help me and I can flex the elbow and pull on the shaft of the arm. Whereas if I was supine, um, I'm basically just trying to pull longitudinal traction without the assistance of gravity. Uh, Dr. Bala from Calcutta wants to ask you, what is, the, what is the chance of a compartment syndrome after closed osteoplasis in maluniting both bones forearm and how do we prevent it? Yeah, so if I'm doing a formal osteotomy of both the radius and ulna or even one, I will extend my fasciotomies under the skin proximally and distally well beyond my osteotomy cut. Typically, as we all recognize, the osteotomy is performed in the mid or proximal third of the uh, forearm. And therefore, uh, you can get a pretty good fasciotomy performed at the time of your osteotomy, certainly by extending your scissors proximally and distally to release the fascia um, by um, underneath the skin. So that's a big way of preventing it. Number two, um, all of my osteotomy patients are um, splinted, not placed in a cast um, with a sugar tongue splint. And then number three, they're admitted to the uh, hospital overnight for at least one night, especially when I'm doing uh, both the radius and ulna in a rotational manner or something such as if I ever needed to do an opening wedge manner, such as that child I showed, um, as opposed to uh, closing wedge osteotomies, which I'm less concerned about compartment syndrome because we're shortening the bone. And I think we just need to recognize that the compartment syndrome in children is different than the adults. And we're really looking for that increasing analgesia requirements. So if they're admitted, um, they get very low dose or no narcotics. And we track what they're taking for their pain medication overnight and ensure that they're not requesting more and more and more, in which case we'd be worried about compartment syndrome. But I think the key um, intraoperative move is extending your fasciotomies um, beneath the skin. Okay, we will take just last two questions before we go on to the cases. One is from Dr. Somesh Virmani Delhi. How do you manage fracture radial neck with an angulation malunion more than 60 degrees and presenting about 12, 14 days later? And also an established uh, radial neck malunion. So what he means is a re late representing radial neck and then an established malunion of the radial neck. Yes. So um, the early on one, so we'll call, let's stick my terminology, nascent malunion, the one that occurs that you see at 12 to 14 days. Um, I will try and reduce anatomically back. Um, again, I'll utilize uh, an osteoclasis type procedure uh, if anyone's familiar with the Bowler procedure, um, where I'll take a Steinman pin, reduce it percutaneously through the skin on the sharp end, remove it, and then turn around and use the blunt end uh, to try and break up some of that callus and use it as a tamp with a mallet to try and tilt the radial neck back into alignment. If that's not successful, I am a little bit more aggressive in open reduction um, of a radial neck fracture. Even in a younger child, because growth arrest of the proximal radius is one number, uh, pretty rare. And two, if it does occur, lots of times we don't necessarily need to do treatment for it. So we want to get it back because as I answer part two of that question, treatment of a established radial neck malunion is extremely difficult. I've done osteotomies of the proximal radius. And the problem is, is that the deformity, by the time you have an established malunion of the proximal radius, typically... It's a year or two out from the injury, and you have um, defor deformation of the radial capitellar joint. And when you perform osteotomy and place the radial head back aligned with the capitellum, with forearm rotation, it tends to spin out. Um, so it'll be aligned in either pronation or supination. And when you turn the form, it actually spins out of the cap off of the capitellum um, because of the deformity and wearing of the articular cartilage that has occurred. And therefore, you want to treat these, again, very early on. So as soon as I see a um, malunion of the proximal radius, I will fix that as early as possible. Uh, in continuation of Dr. Bala's question, he wanted to know if you have encountered uh, compartment syndrome in a closed both bones forearm malunion while doing an osteoplasis and not while doing an open reduction. I personally have not. Um, again, I think we need to be smart in what we do. Um, 
the osteoclasis is done 12 to 14 days. And honestly, osteoclasis, it allows for um, less force to be applied because the fracture um, already has some callus there, as we know. And by breaking it up, it's almost like just pushing the glue into, a, you know, something that has glue on it and falling off, and you're just kind of gently pushing it back into position. So it's much less force than trying to get something out to length, um, which is where we're more commonly will see compartment syndrome occur or multiple reduction attempts. And I would say the other comment on osteoclasis is it either works or it doesn't. So you'll perform your osteoclasis and again, gently manipulate things back into place. And if it doesn't work after a couple of minutes, then um, we're always prepared to proceed to a formal open reduction um, or correction of the malunion. So um, it's not where you're going to be pulling for 20 minutes or 30 minutes where people may try that in the acute setting more likely to have compartment syndrome. Okay, so while I ask Rajiv to get the cases ready, uh, which we are going to present in three modules, uh, module one will be presented by uh, Raj, uh, Rajiv, I'm sorry, Anirban, module two will be presented by Rajiv, and module three, if there's time permitting, then I will step in. We just have uh, time for one last question from the internet again, where someone has asked you, when you do the, uh, you, you use jigs for uh, correcting your malunions, would you prefer them a percutaneous osteotomy or do you prefer to have it done mini open? Yeah, so the jigs I showed are for very complex deformities where you've gotten a CAT scan and the company will manufacture those jigs um, for that specific patient, they're patient specific, um, in which case those are designed to be performed full open. And again, those are the ones that um, you'll worry about compartment syndrome because you're typically correcting a massive deformity and it's typically in both bones of the forearm and you'll perform your fasciotomies. So it's a full open procedure. All right, thank you so much. So we have about over 600 people tuned in and more expected to join in even for the re-reviews. So that's quite a good uh, number for a weekday. And uh, Rajiv, can I uh, request you to share your screen and begin the first module and everyone else to switch off their microphones while he presents that? I think Dr. Anirban has to present this case. Uh, <clears throat> Rajiv, I think the first case is yours. You can present that. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead, Rajiv. Go ahead, Rajiv. Yeah, yeah. Just one second. So this is a 10 year old child who had a supracondyle fracture at six years of age. He was treated with close reduction and cast at that time. Subsequently, he developed cubitus varus and uh, he was operated with a modified French osteotomy after two years for his cubitus varus correction. And when he presented to me, he had persistent varus of 20 degrees with range of motion of 20 to 130 degrees. So this is his clinical picture and video. And this is his X-ray, which he had come up with. So uh, I would like to know uh, from Dr. Abzuk how he would like to approach this case. Sure. So um, I think we'll back up a little bit and just stay on this picture, please. Um, but um, I think we recognize the French osteotomy is very similar to the technique that I described. Instead of fixing the osteotomy with uh, K wires or Simon pins or plate and screws, uh, 
Um, this wire is woven around the two screws. Um, the concern with that is that the wire can obviously break. We certainly see an end of the wire here. I don't know if that's the end that was twisted or if that's where the wire broke. Um, if it's where the wire broke, then the recurrence of the deformity um, certainly occurred because um, all that was done was an osteotomy and then the two screws were placed and nothing held the osteotomy to allow it to heal and not drift back into varus. Um, if the wire did not break, um, then certainly we'd have to question how much correction was performed um, by the original surgeon. Um, so certainly when I have a case like this, I always try to go back to and have the patient get all the x-rays that led to this point. So I can see the original injury as well as um, the x-ray before the surgery, initial surgery was performed. And then obviously the latest x-rays. So I think I always find it helpful um, to go back if possible and get those x-rays. Um, in this case, as we say, what are we going to do? Um, I would like to see a little bit more of the distal humerus and a better x-ray. Um, and if not possible, then I may consider getting a CAT scan or an MRI of the distal humerus just to assess the physis, um, particularly here on the lateral side. I wanna make sure that that physis is open. If it's not, we're gonna have continued uh, deformity uh, occur. Um, typically, however, that would then lead to uh, cubitus valgus down the road, but uh, certainly that would uh, be important information to know what's happening with the physis right here. Um, the bottom line is, if we're going to proceed with correcting this deformity at this point, I think that one other comment is this osteotomy is a little high. Now, possibly the child grew, um, but if you went through my technique, I like to be above the super, the lecranon fossa, so lower down for this osteotomy. And I would do my closing wedge osteotomy um, with a K wire going from here and probably one roughly there to take that wedge out, as I showed in the video and my talk. Um, and then um, I don't like that the child only has 130 degrees of flexion. Um, I probably would build a little extra flexion in, understanding that the child will have worsening um, ability to strain the elbow, but elbow extension, I think we all recognize is less important than elbow flexion. I wanna make sure this child can get their hand to their face for hygiene purposes and potentially their hand to their ear um, for a cell phone purposes um, in this day and age. Thank you. Uh, so we are due to operate this child and he could not come in because of this uh, COVID situation. So hopefully we'll take your advice and uh, operate him subsequently. So let's Over go on to Anirban. Yeah, okay. Uh, Rajiv, can you uh, continue with the, uh, yeah. So, yeah, next slide, please, yeah. So my case was a 21-year-old male who had a right cubitus valgus deformity, and uh, he had a history of childhood injury to the right elbow, which was initially treated conservatively. Now, when he presented to us with this amount of deformity, you can see the pre off range of motion is almost up to 130 degree of flexion, and he has a bit of hyperextension as well. So um, the X-rays, you can see the, on the affected size, it's about a 20, 25 degree uh, cubitus virus as compared to the contralateral normal side. Now, the arrow is being shown. Hopefully, uh, there's no issue in the uh, epiphysis there. You can see the joint line is quite well maintained. Now, whenever we uh, plan an osteotomy in a skeletally more mature uh, patient, uh, there are certain queries which come to our mind. I would uh, uh, put these queries to Dr. Joshua. Well, would we do the same sort of osteotomy as we do in children? Should it be the same lateral flows wedge osteotomy or a medial flows wedge or do a more geometric or uh, a dome type? And uh, what should be the method of fixation? I mean, should it be the same as we would do in children, just K wires? or should we go for more rigid uh, uh, fixation uh, methods? Great, thank you for those questions. So um, as far as I'm gonna go backwards, the method of fixation, um, as I alluded to, as the child approaches skeletal maturity and an older child, and certainly in the adult population, 
We want to stabilize the osteotomy with plate and screw fixation. Um, this is for a few reasons. One, it will allow for earlier range of motion. Um, while we say children's elbows don't get stiff, one, they do get stiff, but certainly in adult population, we want to allow for early range of motion um, of the elbow and the plate and screw fixation will allow that. Typically, you do not need to do um, bicolumnar uh, plate fixation in adult if you're performing a simple closing wedge osteotomy. If you're going to perform a dome um, or some sort of geometric osteotomy, depending on how invasive it is, uh, quite often I'll add uh, dual plates, um, either 90-90 or um, parallel plates to uh, fix and again allow for some early uh, motion at the uh, elbow. As far as what type of osteotomy, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter whether it's a child or adult. What matters for the type of osteotomy is the deformity present. So again, in my hands, I do really try hard to keep it as simple as possible. So in this particular case where it was really just a coronal plane deformity, uh, the, the uh, young adult had excellent elbow flexion um, that certainly was in functional motion as well as his uh, elbow extension. Um, I would perform a full lateral closing wedge osteotomy. However, um, I would add in that medial sided incision to um, transpose the ulnar nerve and take off a little bit of the prominence that will occur um, from the lateral closing wedge osteotomy. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing a dome or a geometric osteotomy. I just think that they're more um, complicated and technically demanding and therefore the outcomes and overall complication rates uh, are, have been shown to be higher in those circumstances. Uh, so, Ban, you should go ahead and show us what you did. Yeah. Uh, next. So, these were the uh, queries which we. Uh, uh, yeah. So, these were the uh, queries which we had. One more question we had was what should be the approach and uh, should we do a molecular osteotomy uh, to get better exposure? So. Uh, yeah. So. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, your uh, take on that, whether we need a, a more extensive approach like the electron osteotomy or just simple uh, lateral approach like you had uh, shown for your cases would be sufficient? Yeah, so I would do the simple lateral approach. And then uh, again, in this case, for so the adult, I would add in the medial approach to transpose the ulnar nerve. And um, I think that an electron osteotomy is not necessary for these procedures because these are extra articular procedures and therefore you do not need access to the elbow joint itself. Uh, these are extra articular osteotomies. And um, in my opinion, there's no need to go violating the elbow joint and particularly adding in electron osteotomy. Right. Uh, so next slide, Rajiv, please, if you would advance. Yep. Yeah, so we did a literature survey. Next, uh, there weren't a lot of series on uh, adult uh, ones. Uh, this technique uh, of an oblique closing wedge with, a, like you mentioned, a single lateral uh, plate fixation uh, was there uh, described from uh, Korea. So uh, we went ahead and did that. Next slide. Yeah, so the advantages of this osteotomy, the oblique plane, as uh, mentioned by the authors, is that you had a higher contact area and lesser chances of a lateral condylar prominence. And since the plate is applied on the lateral tension surface, so only a single plate uh, gives you adequate uh, stable fixation and you can mobilize them uh, fairly early to risk the, reduce the risk of elbow stiffness. So we went ahead and did that. And uh, you can see the uh, post-op x-ray. So that's how it looked immediately post-operatively. And you can see that we've corrected uh, the uh, virus angle as well. And we've just used a lateral plate for fixation. And uh, at follow-up, at, uh, yeah, this is the final follow-up I have at one year. You can see the uh, deformity is fully corrected. The osteotomy has healed quite uh, well. And he's got uh, back his full range of motion and uh, with a good cosmetic and functional result. So uh, the take-home points that I could mention for uh, this case 
is that uh, the oblique osteotomy is, uh, like you mentioned, uh, relatively easier, allowed the translation of the fragment. A single lateral plate did provide stable fixation and early mobilization was possible. Excellent job. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we move on to the next segment because there are quite a few cases in that. Uh, three cases, I think Rajiv, you should run through all three and then we'll have Dr. Joshua commenting on each. Okay. Yeah, so this is a six year old child who had a green stick fracture of radius and displaced fracture of ulna and underwent close reduction and cast. And uh, this was his uh, post union uh, with a radius angulation and rotation. Uh, so, so uh, Rajiv, can I interrupt you? I'm so sorry. Sure. I know we're trying to go quickly, but I just think it's important. To, can you go back one slide? Yep. I think it's important for everyone to recognize that we do not have adequate x-rays to truly assess what is happening. And whoever was treating this beyond did not have adequate x-rays. On the left side, we see an AP is labeled and it's really an AP of the elbow proximally and a lateral yep. at the wrist. And um, on the lateral side on the right, uh, we don't have a true lateral at the wrist. And again, we have an AP sort of view at the elbow. Yep. And uh, that's really unacceptable for everyone out there. Uh, you really need orthogonal views at every time point to really be able to accurately assess uh, what is going on. Sorry to interrupt. I just thought yeah. it was a very important No, that's, uh, that's very a very important. valid point. So I think that's the, uh, uh, one of the reasons for putting this up is that when you're dealing with malunions, you must take the correct uh, x-ray. Go on, Rajiv. Yeah. So uh, this child had a 40 degrees uh, restriction of supination even after waiting for two years. So now my questions are, uh, will it remodel or and how long do I wait further? Okay, and I'm criticizing you. I think that the reason that went on to that malunion was whoever was treating it early on had probably poor x-rays like that and it looked okay, so to speak, but the x-rays were not adequate. Um, so will this model? The answer is no. And again, right back to my same point, we ha almost have an AP view proximally on the picture on the left and a true lateral view uh, on the picture on the light, on, sorry, of the wrist on the picture on the left. Um, so this is obviously a rotational deformity present. And we know that all rotation deformities will not remodel. Now we can accept some malrotation in a malunion, as I mentioned, typically up to 20 or 30 degrees, but we know that that will never remodel. It's just accepted by the patient and not functionally limitating. And at this point, since we know this will re not remodel, um, off of my talk, sooner is better. So I would recommend intervening sooner. Um, and honestly, if this showed up in my office now uh, in this scenario, I would recommend proceeding with um, osteotomies of both the radius and ulna um, now. Okay. So uh, quickly go ahead, Raji. We have only two point five minutes left now, as I am told. Yeah, so we, yeah, yeah we, we have. Uh, so we underwent only radius corrective osteotomy, and we did not touch the ulna. And uh, he had a good function uh, after the union. So quick comments, Dr. Joshua, on using only a single bone fixation when dealing with something like this. Yeah. So I think it's okay if you can correct the, enough of the deformity. I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the previous x-rays and the ulna deformity, um, but certainly here it's lined up fine. Um, sure. Yeah. So, and it worked well. Okay. Go on with the next one. Come on. Yeah. So this is the a last three case. and a half. Yeah. This is a three and a half year old child who was treated conservatively and uh, this was his uh, initial x-ray when he was presented to a doctor. And uh, uh, this was the x-ray when he uh, took out the plaster. And uh, the primary uh, surgeon felt that this is going into a mal union. So he decided to under, underwent a, a deformity correction. So quick comment from you, Dr. Abzu. No, 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 Rajiv, go on. Okay. We just okay. finished the whole okay. case. Yeah, so, uh, so this, this child underwent a corrective osteotomy and a fixation with K-wires and the K-wires were removed in four weeks time. And this looks like going into a non-union, malunion situation. 
where uh, this uh, the bones are not uniting as well as there is a deformity yeah so uh, yeah ultimately he went into a hypertrophic kind of a non union with deformity and there were a cafe olic like spots which were there but eventually he turned out to be a non neurofibroma case so we did a corrective osteotomy and uh, uh, treated him with plates and uh, he united very well so dr joshua's comments on the age of the child and the path which was followed and what would you have done instead and if faced with a malunion or a nonunion your thoughts on what could be the possible reasons in a young child for nonunions sure um so i think we had to recognize again that this was a three and a half year old child uh with a lots of remodeling potential and that those initial x-rays were again a uh, sorry to repeat but inadequate particularly the lateral view uh the, the coronal plane alignment was adequate and certainly acceptable and this goes way back to my second slide in my talk that our job is to understand what will remodel and what will not remodel and if the bone will remodel we should not intervene uh the next comment i'll make is after the initial osteotomy was were performed and intramedullary fixation was utilized 4 weeks time is not enough uh particularly in a form uh intramedullary fixation in my hands is in for a minimum of 12 weeks if not even closer to 16 weeks if i do remove it earlier then the child remains in um plaster or or fiberglass casting until i am definitive that union has occurred as far as what causes non-unions that list is uh, exhaustive um but certainly in this case um it was due to inadequate fixation of the bone um and early removal of the intramedullary fixation uh we always worry about neurofibromatosis um as a potential cause of non-union um but again we it can be hypertrophic in there that was not the case here but i think the hypertrophic nature of this non-union was really due to early removal of the fixation in adequate right. mobilization right so i think we are almost running out of time and i would request sandeep to really uh, give his last uh, closing remarks though personally i think it's been a really exhaustive very very practical and a pretty uh, you know technique related talk and thank you so much for that uh, that that was a very nice talk uh, joshua and you really clarified a lot of uh, concepts very succinctly i think the most important takeaway for us has been that uh, the way you classified uh, the nascent non unions or the nascent mal unions i would say because that is the time where you can get the anatomic alignment to restore function as well as cosmesis by a minimally invasive technique i am sure that it does have a small learning curve but uh, most of us will get over that and will be able to manage the patients much better rather than accepting a mal union which may cause problems later on um i think that 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 should be the take home message from uh, mal unions secondly i thought the osteotomies around the growth plates have to be reserved towards adolescence when not much growth is remaining so it's not as if you are saying that you are going to do that at lower end radius when the child is 6 years or 7 years old i'm sure that wasn't the message because that would definitely cause a uh, uh, a growth arrest so all in all it was very enlightening and i do hope you come to goa thank you very much for your time and uh, we will email you with more questions thank you panel rajiv anirban and rujuta thank you very much thank you dhiren bhai and uh, sandeep for this opportunity and thank you once again dr joshua and stay safe and we wish everybody comes out of this pandemic uh, happy and kicking bye bye thank you bye bye good night good night good night thank you all